Welcome everyone, it's Frank here from Talking Grace and welcome to 2023. I think this is our first video for the year. <clears throat> it's going to be on the power to say no to things. And there's going to be many things this year that's going to pop up in our lives. And the ability to say no will help us. Do you know how to say no? Uh, well, we should. Understanding the power and the importance of this word is a mark of maturity. Here's a uh, quote from an author of a book, The Power of No. When you say, her name is, uh, sorry, his name is James Altucher, Altucher. He says this, when you say yes to something you don't want, you don't want to do, here is the result. You hate what you are doing. You, result, you resent the person who asked you and you hurt yourself. In another article on the power of no, uh, this author, Judith Sills, she says this, We find no tough to dish out. Tough but absolutely necessary because in the big picture, bottom line, we need to stick up for ourselves. No test the health, no test the health of antiquity of your closest relationships. If you feel you cannot say no, at least to some things, some of the time, then you are not being loved, you are being controlled. <clears throat> she goes on to say, a moment of clear choice, it announces, however, indirectly, something affirmative about you. I will not sign, because this is not my truth. I will not join your committee, help your kids review your project because I am committed to some important project of my own. Count me out. <clears throat> because I'm not comfortable, not in agreement, not, in, not on the bandwagon, no thank you because you might hurt if I am down and your invitation might but my needs, but my needs take priority. And then she says, it says that while each of us interacts with others and loves, respects and values those relationships, we do not and cannot allow ourselves always to be influenced by them. The strength we draw from saying no is that it underscores this hard truth of maturity. The buck stops here. Power to say no. <clears throat> what about our relationship with God, our Father. Do we, is it healthy to say no to God? What do you think? Or what about the Almighty God? Does He demonstrate His ability to say no? Yahweh did, for sure. He said no. What about the Father? Does He say no? When Jesus came onto the earth, was he saying no to people? What do you think? How would you answer that? The difficulty is is in knowing why what the Father says no or why Jehovah says no. For example, take take Moses. Uh, he was told by God that he would not enter the promised land. Why? For his failure at Numbers chapter 20, verses 10 to 12. You can have a read of that. You probably know the story. And Moses told the people at Deuteronomy chapter 3, verses 23 to 26. At that time, I earnestly prayed, Sovereign Lord, I know that you have shown me only the beginning of the great and wonderful things you are going to do. There is no God in heaven or on earth who can do the mighty things you have done. Let me cross the Jordan River, Lord, and see the fertile land on the other side, the beautiful hill country and the Lebanon mountains. But because of you, because of you people, the Lord was angry with me and would not listen. Instead, he said, that's enough. Don't mention this again. That's from the Good News Translation. Interesting little conversation there that Moses felt about what Jehovah 
Yahweh YHWH said to him and why he couldn't cross over and how he felt about that no from Yahweh. So Moses, we know, never entered the promised land. In fact, God said no to him. Was this the father that said no to him for that indiscretion? You might think of another time where David committed adultery, murder. By law, Yahweh's own law, he should have been put to death. But he wasn't. He was granted life. So he didn't say no to him being executed. Sorry, he, he didn't allow him to be executed. He gave him life. He pardoned him. Why didn't he just pardon Moses for a little indiscretion? I don't know. Just asking, right? So we see that Yahweh, Jehovah, YHWH, he does say no, and he does say yes, even to worse crimes, to some worse crimes than in other cases. In other cases, it just depends, really. Depends how he evaluates it. But nevertheless, he does say no. What about poor, thorn in the flesh? <clears throat> For example, in in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, 9, he says, In order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul had to accept that his repeated request for relief was denied. And brief explanation that something more important was being accomplished. But this did not obviously weaken his faith or his relationship with Jesus or with the Father. Did God say no to Paul? To what exactly is he talking about? Well, let's have a look at the context because unfortunately... This has been misused, this passage, by Christians to justify to submitting to any problem or any situation that comes their way. Um, for example, uh, I looked at the Watchtower. <clears throat> uh, they have a different, they have a couple of options that, that they uh, now, today, when you go to their website and look this up, give you uh, it says there on their website it is referring to false apostles and those who challenge Paul as an apostle that's one of the possibilities another possibility is referring to his eyes he had pussy eyes so they're talking about a a, uh, a problem that he had they go back to the time of his conversion at Damascus where he was blinded by the light so he had an eye problem, they reckon, <clears throat> because of that. Interesting, uh, also pride to keep him humble, right? So this is why this thorn wasn't taken away. So the, the Watchtower gives a lot of uh, options. In the Watchtower 51, 1951, page 271, 273, it says this, But are we not also privileged to pray to God in our physical sickness and speak about him? Because some... Some don't want to say that physical healing is possible today, right? So they use this as a, as a way to say, you see, it didn't happen for Paul and he had the spiritual gifts. But let's have a look. This is what they say in, back in 51. Yes, is it, uh, let me ask the question again, their question. But are we not also privileged to pray to God in our physical sickness and speak to him about it? Yes, we are. But we are not to pray for divine healing. The day for that is past. The gift of the Spirit passed away with the, with the deceased of the apostles and their immediate associates. So here they're acknowledging that it was possible back then with the immediate and their, the believers or their associates, whoever that is. Um, so I'm assuming they're saying it wasn't granted for everybody. <clears throat> 
This is their view, of course. Furthermore, it says that this miraculous healing was to be assigned to outsiders and to be performed upon them. So, again, they're saying it wasn't for the insiders. So, if you're a believer, it wasn't for you. It was for the outsiders only. So, they, why? I guess that they can be a believer. So, once you became a believer, that means, according to them, you wouldn't need to be healed again if you got sick. You couldn't ask for it or it wouldn't work for you because, why? Because it was for a sign for the outsiders. Um, what else did they say here? It was not to be used for the selfish... It says there, furthermore, this... Okay, I, I read that. It was not to be used for selfish comfort of believers. So you're sick, you're a believer, you're a child of God. God doesn't want you healed. No, no, this is selfish for you to ask to be healed. Why would you want to ask God for... Be, you know, you should be grateful. That's what they're saying. Paul, then he says this, Paul... Uh, had this thorn in the flesh. Then it says there, did he pray about it? So highly gifted as he was, did he miraculously pluck this thorn out of his flesh himself, or did God do it for him with divine power? Then it says, please read Second Corinthians. So after you read that, uh, 6 to 10, Paul failed to get divine healing. This is their, their uh, result in paragraph 17. I'm not going to read the whole lot, just this one sentence. Paul failed to get divine healing in this respect, so it was a no from the Lord in their view for divine feeling for the, the above reasons. So it's interesting, right? What do you think? Well, the thorn in the flesh that Paul mentioned, let's have a review of this topic and let's see if we can get a better perspective because we've got to look at the context. And the pre and post context and what, what he's actually saying in the middle. So the thorn in the flesh that Paul mentioned has been, as we say, has been used and misused by Christians to justify submitting to basically any problem that comes along. And of course, I believe that Satan has twisted these texts around to deceive many. Uh, and even people who believe that God would not heal Paul uh, or, or, or so, so therefore, if if God's not going to heal Paul, how should we then be healed? Why would we want to be healed, right? How could we be healed? Uh, that's the the bottom line. But first, first of all, notice that the thorn came because of the abundance of revelations. For example, let's have a read of this. I'm going to read from the King James Version. Um. Should I? Let me see. Let's see if there's another version. Because the King James, although it's very good, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to get, to grasp. All right, I'll read the King James. <laughs> and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I, I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather glorify glory in my infirmities than the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for the sake, for Christ's sake, for I, when I'm weak, I'm strong. So immediately, what's the what do we see there in verse 7? He said that, notice he said, at, at least I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given, right, so... If you read earlier on the in the chapter, Paul's saying to these Corinthians who were who he calls saints, who were you know like us basically, Gentiles are all over the place. They were new believers. They had all these gifts. Wonderful things were happening to them, in fact. But they're also getting misled within. 
right? There was the super fine apostles, these fake apostles who were giving them another Jesus um, sermon, you know, and they were putting up with all that. They were believing everything, right? Because they were immature, although they were saved. He said that they'd been washed clean. They were justified before God, even though some of them were like us, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, you know, um, all sorts of things, right? Um, so he's saying to them, you're, you're willing to put up with that. Well, let me tell you a little bit about me, right? So he's telling them, at, 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 least, at least I should be exalted, why? Above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Now, here's the thing. What, now, let's look at some of these Greek words, what he's saying here. The words above measure are taken from the Greek word hyperero, a compound of the words hupa and ero. The word hupa means over and above and beyond. It depicts something that is way beyond measure and conveys the idea of something that is greater, superior, higher, better, more than, more than a match of utmost paramount or foremost. It would also describe something that is first rate, first class, top notch, unsurpassed, unequaled, and unrivaled by a person or thing. And now the second part is exalted above measure means to lift up or to be exalted. <clears throat> so when you put these uh, words together, it speaks of a person who is supremely exalted. This is a person who has been magnified, increased, lifted up to a, to a place of great prestige and influence. Although it can be used to express the idea of a person who has haughtily exalted himself, this is not the idea that Paul has in mind when he writes this verse. Rather, this is a person who has been greatly honored and recognized due to something he has written, done, or achieved. Notice it says there he refers to the abundance of the revelations. Now, here's another Greek word there, abundance, which uh, describes... Something that is phenomenal, extraordinary, unparalleled, or unmatched. Okay, so now he also uses the word, um, and and then in Revelations, and this refers to something that has been veiled or hidden for a long time, and then suddenly, almost instantaneously, becomes clear and visible to the mind or eye. It's like pulling the curtains out of the way so that you can see what has always been just outside your window, okay? The scene has always been there for you to enjoy, but the curtains blocked your ability to see the real picture. The moment you see beyond the curtain for the first time and observe what has always been there um, along, um, that is now becomes evident to you. That is the revelation. So Paul is now saying that the curtain has been pulled back because of what he has received by the Lord Jesus. And he's able to now tell you about the spiritual things that is happening to us as a believer and has been happening to Christ, right? Through Christ and through the Father. So when he went everywhere he went, he was preaching about your identity in Christ. You know that right through the scriptures, if you've carefully examined that, and your freedom in Christ, and of course, the enemy doesn't want you to know who you are in your identity, that you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, right? That you have Christ in you, that you have a new heart, that old heart is gone, that you actually are aware of what's going on in the world. You have the truth in you. You just need to understand that and allow the Spirit to yield to the Spirit so you can receive that truth. It's dormant. It's in the air. You've just got to allow that to happen. And that's what Paul was preaching and doing. Now, you can imagine the alarm bells would start ringing in Satan's head. Mate, this guy is moving along quickly. We don't like what he's doing, right? So what does he do? He sends a messenger. Notice he says, There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me. Huh. So there's your thorn in the flesh. Is it a physical illness? Well, it's a messenger of Satan. What's he trying to buffet? What does this buffet mean? Well, the, the Greek word for thorn is the word 
Skolops or Skolops, S-K-O-L-O-P-S, a word to describe a dangerously sharp spiked instrument or tool. However, this was also to describe the stake on which an enemy's head was stuck after being decapitated. That's what it means. So the word scallops gives the impression that this thorn was painful. Some have suggested that this, you know, as we said, in the flesh refers to physical sickness, but this is not affirmed by any scripture in the New Testament and should be taken as unsubstantiated conjecture. People have gone so far in their imagination as to assert that Paul suffered from malaria, epilepsy, eye disease, club feet, and or a hunchback. And unfortunately, there is nothing in the New Testament scripture to back such speculations. However, one thing we do see, Satan wanted Paul's head on a stake. He wanted to eliminate this man of God and put, put him completely out of the picture. Instead of referring to sickness... The words in the flesh most likely describe a type of event that was a constant source of irritation to the Apostle Paul. And what would that be? Well, the context tells you that he had reproaches, persecutions, distresses in the sake of Christ. <clears throat> and that was the assignment of the messenger of Satan. He right? says, the messenger of Satan came to buffet me. This idea of buffeting then is this, this idea of striking or like you see the waves flowing in, a, in, a, in an ocean, constant. Right? This is what it means to be striking him all the time. And, and the, the uh, messenger of Satan um, is actually the word angelos. So it can mean also an angel. Right? And this, he's like a, a special mission this angel has got. He's, he's commissioned to do something. He's like an, an operative of some sort of CIA, KGB or whatever. And, and Paul is an ambassador of Christ. So he is a special agent as well, if you like, right? And now Satan wants to combat his, his abundant work of revelation that he's received, which he's now spreading this gospel of Christ, the grace gospel to people. And they're, they're becoming believers, they're getting gifts, they're understanding what's going on or not, and he's extracting them. So what is he doing? He's now throwing everything he can. What, is, what, do, what do these special operatives do from the CIA and so on? Well, they cause all sorts of, uh, they can do all sorts of things, right? On planet Earth, right now, disrupt things, cause whatever. Whatever they got to do, right? to slow the opposition down. <clears throat> so th this messenger of Satan was dispatched to keep Paul from gaining momentum. And how would he do that? <clears throat> well, look at what was going on with Paul. He was preaching to people, kings, governors, leaders, world leaders at the time. He was establishing churches. He was writing letters. <clears throat> He was pushing back the forces of evil. Um, the revelations that, that Christ gave him were about to change the course of human history. Now, can you imagine you're the enemy leader and you're thinking, what do I got to do to buffet this guy? How am I going to do it? Well, you would strategically um, cause... Um, headache for him right slow him down distract him and how was he distracted well he's writing letters to these congregations in corinth for example who were born again believers but now he has to deal with all their issues and he's trying to now help them right? <laughs> lovingly but not just them right so he also had other super fine apostles who were having a go at him and they were um bringing in another gospel which he had to counteract. It's interesting that none of these guys within this body of Christ or the congregations were ever excommunicated. Oh, we had that really bad one in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, right? But he was brought straight back in. And it, and it really, it's taken out of context the way people use that. But they use it 
right? To justify why they want to shun you and kick you out. But honestly, if what was happening in Corinth was happening in any congregation today of Jehovah's Witnesses or most churches, you'd have them all kicked out of the door, wouldn't you? Of course you would. <laughs> but not Paul. No, they didn't do that. Interesting, right? Hmm. So it was all these different groups, these persecutions now that were happening, which is just normal for us, which is part and parcel of being a believer. All those who live in godly devotion will suffer persecution. So this was these reproaches, and you can go into Second Corinthians, I think it is Paul, or Second or Chapter Eleven, or whatever he talks about all these beatings he took. And so on. So we see that it's not anything to do with physical illnesses, but rather the persecution. This was the, the thorn in the flesh that was um, holding Paul back. It was distracting him. It was causing, you know, trying to slow the work down. But he accepted it because through him, the power of Christ rested and glory was given back to them. I want you to imagine... Now, it does say there, uh, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. Um, and some, some will try and use that and say, well, I see you're sick. Look, the reality is that the word could mean sick, but it also can mean, um, you know, where you're getting your head punched in sort of thing. Um, so it's it's a, it has two, two meanings behind it. It's not just the sickness um, that it's talking about the, the whatever, let me find it. For example, here's an example of it. This in Romans eight twenty six, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. So this is the the other definition that it can come under. So in this context, in Romans eight twenty six. The context makes it clear that it's not speaking of sickness, but rather not knowing what to pray for. So in other words, our finite minds are, infirmi are in infirmity or have an inadequacy. So it's not just one thing. Uh, if we look at the context of Paul's thorn in the flesh, we find that infirmity does not mean sickness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and, and 10. In 2 Corinthians 11.30, Paul used the exact terminology of glorifying in infirmities that is used just as a few verses later in speaking about his this thorn. In the 11th chapter, he had just finished listing those infirmities. And they were imprisonment, stripes, uh, shipwrecks, stonings. None of them speak of, but none of them speak of a sickness. So all these things listed in Second Corinthians refer to persecutions uh, as infirmities. So in context, Paul's thorn was a demonic angel or messenger sent by Satan, which continually stirred up persecution against him. And this is also verified in the three, you can verify this in three Old Testament references, Numbers 33, 55, Joshua 23, 13, and Judges 2, 3. And these are actually all quoted also from the Watchtower where people are spoken of as being thorns, thorns in your sides and thorns in your eyes. So yes, Paul did ask the Lord to remove persecution from him, not sickness. And the Lord told him that his grace was sufficient. We are not redeemed from persecution. That's the thing key to remember. Paul later stated that when when he said that in 2 Corinthians 3.12, where, we, where I quoted earlier, that all that will... All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Um, what's interesting about the, the eye business, some try to use that. At Acts 14, 19, Paul was stoned and left for dead. Uh, then God, then he was raised up. And then the next day he walked at least uh, 20 miles or 40 k's into the next town and started preaching again. So we'll go through this, this little timeline. So the Lord didn't stop the persecution, but he did what the Lord told him to do, which was to flee. 
and but he was strengthened uh, in in Paul's by by God and Paul's weaknesses um, highlighted this because you can imagine being stoned to death one day, black and blue, and then this guy gets up and he he walks forty k's and continues preaching. This is supernatural strength of God. I mean, if I was if I was the guy that persecuted him, right, as a Jew. And then I saw him walk up and go. I, I'd be thinking, "Wow, what? What's going on here?" Right. Um, and so this helps us then to go to Galatians chapter four, which a lot of people use. So there are two passages of scripture that those who believe Paul's thorn in the flesh was was sickness, and have tried to use that to verify that. The one is in Galatians four thirteen to fifteen. He Paul says that. He preached the gospel to the Galatians through an infirmity of the flesh. And verse 15, he makes reference to the people being uh, being willing to poke out their eyes and give that to him. From this, many ministries preach that poor thorn was a you know disease or eye thing, whatever, uh, runny eyes, puffy eyes, whatever. Paul was speaking to when he said, when, when he said this, he was just beaten up, right? And if you've seen someone that's really been beaten up, their eyes are like this, you know? They're, they're full of cuts and bruises. <laughs> so it's not unusual. He was writing to the people who lived in the region known as Galatia, which had, had its major cities in Derby, Lystra, and Iconium, the instance where he, we mentioned earlier where Paul was stoned and left for dead happened in Lystra, the city of Galatia. The next day Paul work, walked to Derby, another city in Galatia, and began preaching unto them. Right? So he would have been black and blue and still going. Uh, you know, um, would I have done that? No, but I'm not Paul. Right? So... <clears throat> So it would be the, uh, you know, he would be writing uh, with this in mind, as opposed to, you know, this was my issue. And then in Galatians chapter 6, verse 11 says, You see, ye see how large a letter I've written unto you with my own hand. And so people have said Paul's eyes were so bad that he had to write in large letters. And this is what he was making reference to. That is only a supposition and not a very good one at that. It is more. It is a. It is a lot more credible to believe that he was simply referring to the long letter he had written to the Galatians. Why is it important that we know or realize that the thorn in the flesh was not something from which Jesus died? Um, which Jesus died and redeemed us from sin, such as also sickness. See, if we believe <clears throat> that, as the Watchtower stated and many religions teach, that it has to do with, with sickness and God saying no, then you're not going to believe that what you have in you, the Spirit of God and, the, and Christ's Spirit and... Um, you know, the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> what has been done to you um, is no longer available. That is the healing of you. You see, he he bore, according to Isaiah 53, Jesus bore all our sicknesses on the cross. Not only just sin, but we're healed, it says there, from his stripes, Right? And that's what I think uh, in the book of Matthew, it's quoted that. He quotes uh, Jesus and he says that very thing, that it's, uh, he, he, um, he heals from the sicknesses. And so this is something that we need to start to think about. Is, is the Father saying, no, I'm not going to heal you from your sickness. No, you can't be better. No. Why? Because the apostles were the ones who had these gifts and certain ones had these gifts and these gifts were only assigned to outsiders, had nothing to do with people inside. Right? 
Does does that make sense to you? What on earth is going on with that reasoning? It's a satanic lie, in my opinion, to throw that at you. Because if you can if you if you believe, right, that that doesn't work for you, that you are not completely saved, you're not completely forgiven, you all your past sins, past, present and future are not forgiven, you're still on the treadmill of works and that the res resurrected Christ's life in you is really not that powerful, what sort of life are you going to live? Aren't you not going to be full of doubt? Aren't you, not, aren't you always going to be unsure whether or not your prayer is, is accepted by God or forgiveness and you know that you're asked that to be healed? You're not, you're not going to really believe that, right? I mean, let's face it, your faith is already sort of not sure you're not sure about your salvation you're not sure if you're forgiven you're not sure if you can be healed you're not sure if you can do anything what can you do i mean what what is it as for a believer what what has he got what sort of truth have you got you see the biggest truth that paul and these writers were telling us are telling us that you're a child of god one, he's adopted us. We're seated in the heavens. We've been totally forgiven. It's a gift. We're a new creation. We have a new spirit. The old person is dead, right? That's what it clearly says in the book of Romans. Gone, finished. We we have Christ in us. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. It's cleaned house. The Father's cleaned us up. Holy. We are the temple. We are walking, talking temple of God on this planet and yet we're a new creation new spirit we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us we have the fruit of the Spirit <laughs> right it's not nothing that we're doing it's all being given to us as a download and now we can express and live our lives now what we, what religion is saying to you no that's not true what they're saying to you is no you're not totally forgiven you're sort of forgiven now, you're not totally saved. You're sort of saved, right? You've got to keep continue on. You can't heal. There's no such thing as healing. It's finished. Happened in the first century. Oh, what about this case? Well, maybe some people. Some people can get healed. Some people can't, right? But I, I prayed and I was healed. Oh, well, you know, I, oh, no, that's nice. Let's, let's give you a clap, right? This is what religion wants to say to you because that... They're really scared to say no to somebody that says that they have been healed. Even if you, in their mind they're thinking, no, that doesn't work anymore, bro. <laughs> right? Like the Watchtower did. No, that's gone, man. Don't even go there. Right? That's false teaching. That's demonic teaching to say that you can be healed. So today, I want you to think about what, what's Paul saying. And the, Yes, it's good to say no. But is the Father saying no to you getting better? Does He want you to get better? How many people did Jesus say no to that came to Him who were sick? Uh, yeah, it's hard for me to think. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe there was somebody. I don't know. Now, I'm not talking about becoming a multi-millionaire. Oh, give me millions of dollars, then I'll be okay. <laughs> okay, maybe that's out of His will, right? But to take care of you and look after you. I mean, you're his child. Wouldn't you as a father want to take care of your son? And, you know, if your son or daughter is coughing and sneezing, don't you want them to get better? Don't you try your best to give them the best medical um, help that's available? Well, Jesus said, you know, your father, although you're evil, Jesus said, although you're evil, you, you want to do good for your kids, right? You give them good things. On the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, I think. He said, what do you think about the Father? You're evil. Well, don't you think he's much better, right? He's good. He's a good God. He wants to take care of you. So why would that change, friends? You see, I think this is something we can explore more of. 
and know that if we have all this dynamic energy, abundance of energy in us, which has also the capacity to heal, why wouldn't it happen? But if we don't believe it, because we've been told it's rubbish, that it's dead, dead when the apostles died and their immediate associates, of course you're not going to believe anything, right? Does the Father say no? Yup, we know Yahweh said no, plenty of times. To Moses was the, uh, a big one, right? Big scalp with Moses. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to talk about Job uh, and all that. Um, or even um, look at other possibilities. No, Job is in the Old Testament and it's with Yahweh. And that's a whole separate scene there. Well, I'd like to do a separate topic on that, which I plan to do. So I'm going to leave that out. But that's in the past. I'm talking about the future, when Jesus came and died. We know this, uh, that in 2 Corinthians 1.20, um, Paul said this to the Corinthians. He says, No matter how many the promises of God are, they have become yes by means of him. So all the promises of God has come yes through Jesus. So therefore it's become a yes through Paul, through Christ, and through the apostles, and through them. They had the gifts as well. They needed to understand how that worked. And Paul was giving them instructions on how all these things applied. It's interesting that in Psalm 145 also it says this, You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Is that a no? No. <clears throat> there will be, of course, uh, a time where there will, the whole humanity, there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more sickness, no more death. No more want. Yes, that is true. That is a, a, a future goal. <clears throat> but what about us today as believers? Right? Is God saying no? Like some would want to say about the impossible with, with the thorn of the flesh. In context, it's got nothing to do with physical healing. Right, a messenger of Satan. God's not working with with a Satan to try and keep us our uh, our egos down. It's got nothing to do with that, no. Right, this was a this was an operation by Satan. Where Paul's exposing this and saying, "Hey, Satan, this is what's going on. Right, this is what's happening. I'm being persecuted. Why? Because the good news doesn't. He doesn't want the good news to be spread." Good news about what? You. You and I. Accepting Jesus, believing Jesus, means becoming a new creation. Means that now we have the power to resist Satan, to keep him away, right? Because why? We are now seated in heavenly places and he can't touch you. He can't touch you. But you can do so much good to humanity while you're alive in this physical body because you are a temple you and I are a temple of the living God so that's good news so anyway hopefully this uh, has been a, a little bit um, a different perspective of what you currently think of that topic have a great day guys let me know if you want to if you want if you want to say something let me know free to uh, make a comment if not that's not a problem have a great day talk to you soon see you later